Hey everybody, it's Tom. This week I am going to discuss uh, Gaston Bachelard. Gaston Bachelard, born in 1884, um, died doo -doo -doo -doo, in 1962. And he's early, he's one of those figures of whom many people have not heard, but who's actually exerted a kind of subterranean influence in the philosophy of science and in other domains as well. Uh, some of his early works included uh, Le Nouveau Esprit Scientifique or The New or Emerging Scientific Mind or La Formation de l'Esprit Scientifique or The Formation of the Scientific Mind. And in these works he developed notions which would then become very important to people such as Thomas Kuhn, Structure of the Scientific Revolution, um, and other more well-known philosophers of science in the Marxist tradition. He influenced Louis Althusser um, and uh, what he was saying was that in many ways the development of science rather than following a more or less linear projection is connected to the happenstances of our psychology. Uh, to mental patterns that we need to, uh, from which we need to liberate ourselves, and thus the notion of the epistemological break or the epistemological obstacle, etc., etc. So that work notwithstanding, what I'm actually going to talk about is a text from later in his career, La Poétique uh, des Espaces, La Poétique des Espaces. Uh, or the poetics of space. Um, which I think it came out in 1958 and represents in a way a departure. Though you can see uh, an anticipation of its tact in his earlier work. Um, it comes on the heel of some other fascinating uh, enterprises. He wrote a book, uh, The Psychoanalysis of Fire. He wrote several books on the four elements. Anyway, to get to the poetics of space, what's exciting about this book? Well, it was received uh, relatively well and uh, within the domain of architecture has informed various people as well because he maintains, uh, actually somewhat implicitly, he never, I think, states this quite outrightly, that attention to the spaces of our environment can actually elicit a state which is uh, emancipatory, which frees us from the uh, bondage of our own personal or particular history. The point of departure for this argument is the notion of the poetic image, that when you encounter or when you read a poem, the image itself has a capacity to free you from your own personal history. In this regard, he's making a radical claim explicitly that the, this, the, the, the perspective of a pure relationship with a poem, a phenomenological relationship with a poem, will actually give rise to an insight, an apprehension that you are more than the sum of your history, that you have a creative power, that you have, in fact, freedom. He uses the notion of a phenomenological disposition advisedly. Now, phenomenology, significant tradition with which many of you may already be somewhat aware, uh, calls us to return to an appreciation of our most fundamental consciousness before it is, as it were, uh, freighted with the uh, creations of lenses, rubrics, attitudes that are formed by dint of um, cultural particularity. Uh, the, the, the fountainhead of that tradition is really uh, Edmund Husserl, and we'll do more on that on another day. But for the purpose of this video, what, what, what counts is the idea that you want to return to your experience in its most fundamental aspect. What 
is right in front of you. Before you super add deeply conditioned interpretations. And in fact, to try and approach that state systematically, no easy thing. That's part of why poetry is so powerful because it almost effortlessly pulls us into that state. Almost effortlessly. Um, and, you know, I mean, take for example, uh, just off the top of my head, you can look at that wonderful uh, poem by Edgar Allan Poe, The Raven. Uh, distinctly, I remember it was in the bleak December and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Well, you know that. Each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. That image, or the silken sad uncertain rustling of each purple curtain, thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never dreamt before, something to that effect. But the point is that the image possesses us and draws us into a condition of, of reverie, of daydreaming, to use uh, Bachelard's term. Uh, and within this space, then, is when that sort of primordial contact with the, our, our, our experience with reality transpires. Uh, Using this motif, he then explores poetic images of architectural figures, the house, aspects of the house, such as corners, the house's verticality, its relationship to the terrestrial and the subterranean and the celestial and the ethereal, uh, the house as a shelter, the universe as a shelter, and he goes on from there meditates even upon the elements within the house such as furniture and analogs to the house in the natural world like nests, shells and then having undertaken these case studies there's a little bit more in terms of the dialectics of outside, inside of the miniature versus the immense and I would feel like I am almost robbing you of an experience to just go ahead and relay the particulars of those investigations. Rather, I would, I would encourage you to go ahead and just acquire the book yourself and really sit with them because they're, they're just so scintillating, they're just so fantastic, and they just allow you to see the world in a different way. Uh, to wrap this up, though, for today, I want to come back to this notion of the power of the poem to take us outside of our personal history. Well, I didn't say personal history, you know, again, I'm dealing with what is uh, Bachelard's critique of the psychological and the psychoanalytic viewpoints uh, in their reductionist and their reductionist implications. Because what those viewpoints do is they say that we are bound by a network of causality. And um, what happens when you encounter a fantastic image from a great poet, possibly someone, well, you know, born in a different time, born in a different culture, and using sometimes a different language, what happens is that all of a sudden you have a resonance. A resonance with what they are saying. Which grows out of a kinship that is more fundamental than anything that can be described as a consequence of mere historical accident. Or um, physical or genetic analogy. And here he's making a somewhat daring claim. He's saying that the reason a poem can do this is because it's founded in being in a particular way. Uh, he draws on some previous figures, uh, particularly uh, a chap by the name of uh, Minkowski and also uh, Henri Bergson who do some groundwork uh, where, you know, for example, Minkowski drawing on Bergson that Bergson saw that what, what, I'm not deeply familiar with him, but my understanding is that for Henri Bergson, 
or Bergson, B-E-R-G-S-O-N, the principle of human life, which he called a kind of élan vital, uh, transcends reduction and is itself kind of efflorescence of being. When a poetic figure or image elicits from us a sense of transcendence and identification, reverberation with the poet is if we ourselves have written that poem that's happening because we're connecting trans subjectively with being itself and why however we can say beyond this kind of discursive sketch of the process why though does that free us from a sense of causality well it frees us from a sense of causality I can see just off the top of my head in three powerful ways. One being that, and this is one of uh, Bachelard's emphases, one being the creative aspect of what's occurring. And concomitantly, right along with it, it's unexpected aspect. You don't know what's about to happen. But the fact that you still connect with it indicates your freedom to move outside of what is determined. That's really one and two, right? The creative and the unexpected, you know. The other is that the identification with the, the poet is not something that can be understood uh, in terms of conventional avenues of identification. There's something which, which transcends any uh, familial or political connection. There's something about human being that goes beyond our individualities that is enabling this sense of identification. Uh, now, there's a kind of two-fold thing going on there. There's a sense of reverberation with being itself. And then there's a sense of resonance, if you want to sort of use those two in a slightly uh, more refined manner. The resonance is where we can see the aspects of the poem uh, manifest in the circumstances of our own life. But what is that, that is secondary, that is derivative. The psychologists and the psychoanalysts, they would actually say that that is what's primary. But the Bachelard's point is, no, 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 that's there, and sometimes it can be useful, but it's derivative. What's primary is a reverberation with being itself. And in providing this account and by sort of encouraging us to re-engage with the poetic as opposed to merely the po prosaic, Bachelard is offering really phenomenally subversive and exciting suggestion. So I think we really deserve uh, to revisit his work. Not just for its implications for architecture, but for its implications for our lives altogether. Shall we not strive to live more poetically rather than to simply capitulate to the monotonous? This is, I think, for, for what Bachelard is calling. And, uh, you know, he's got all sorts of other great stuff happening. Uh, just wanted to give you this initial sketch. Uh, hopefully it wasn't too dilatory um, in quality. So that's that's what we're coming to you this week. Okay, try and I guess I'm sort of summing it up in an almost uh, too didactic manner. But what I'm really trying to, to, to say is that we should listen to Bachelard in his book The Poetics of Space for his encouragement to accept the reality of our freedom. And we should be grateful to the poetic as putting us in experiential contact with that freedom. The other, when, you know what can be explored with freedom as a point of departure then is the question of love. How does love flow forth from freedom? And uh, that, I believe, will be what we take up next week.
I got some other videos going on which don't immediately connect with the theme of love, okay, because it just kind of came to me that that's really the next natural step. Uh, I might do something on uh, Gödel's proof and just some other stuff in the um, in the pipeline, but I think that's that's where we'll leave it for today. Thank you all for listening. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't already, and go ahead and check them out. Gaston Bachelard. It's fun to say his name, isn't it? Bachelard. Um, the translator, by the way, here was. Oh, so sorry I didn't mention this earlier. Uh, Maria Jolas, J O L A S. Anyway, I'll put that in the link in the description below. Thanks again, everybody, for listening, and I'll catch you next week.